Welcome to Washington Hospital Today, dedicated to informing residents about healthcare topics and issues. Through programs featuring community forums and free health and wellness classes, our goal is to empower community members with the information needed to make informed health decisions. Washington Hospital has been providing health care to the residents of the Washington Township Healthcare District for the past 60 years. Hello and welcome. Today's presentation, Don't Let a Hip Pain Win, is presented by Dr. Alexander Saw. Dr. Saw is an orthopedic surgeon with Saw Orthopedic Associates at the Institute for Joint Restoration located in Fremont. Without further ado, please welcome Dr. Alexander Saw. My name is Alex Saw and thank you so much for joining this evening. Just as a brief background for those of you who don't know me or if you're not from the Tri-City area, I was actually born here in Fremont at Washington Hospital where I practice now. I went out east for college and did my residency training in orthopedics at Harvard and then did a fellowship in Chicago for joint replacement and revision surgery and then returned in 2008. So I've been medical co-director of the Institute for Joint Restoration since 2012 and outpatient joint replacement director since 2014. And this is just a sample article. That's actually my father. So my father was a head and neck surgeon here for 40 plus years. He was chief of staff and on the board and continues to volunteer at the hospital. And this is a picture of me and him then. So really, it's been great to come back to the community where I grew up. It's great to serve the, the people and the other physicians and the patients that my father did and, and continue to do. So it's great to be here and to give this se seminar today. The procedures that I do are total knee replacement including revision surgery, partial knee replacement, and total hip replacement, which we're talking about this evening. I also focus on multimodal pain management strategies, minimally invasive surgery for more rapid recovery, and outpatient joint replacement, as well as anterior hip replacement, which we'll talk about tonight. As I mentioned, I'm co-director of the Institute for Joint Restoration, but also work with other committees and organizations, not only locally, but also nationally on hip and knee replacement. Uh, even though we're a community uh, hospital due to our volume and due to the outcomes we have here it gives us great opportunity to present our research and be involved in hip and knee surgery even on a national level and this is my team and really our commitment is to our patients so we really put our patients first and want to be able to help them before surgery whether they need surgery or not after surgery of course we really feel we make long long life commitments and relationships with our patients so uh, with that, I'm going to show you the overview of what we're going to try to talk about this evening. It is an ambitious outline. We're going to try to cover a lot of material, but we're going to start with hip arthritis basics, just an understanding of what the hip anatomy and function is. Non-operative treatments, for, so for those of you who have hip pain, how can you treat that pain with medications or alternatives without having surgery? I will then describe what hip replacement is, what the, how the procedure works, what are minimally invasive techniques. We'll talk then about anterior hip replacement with its potential advantages. We'll talk about our Institute for Joint Restoration here. We'll talk about rapid recovery, hip and knee surgery, really what that entails. And lastly, outpatient joint replacement, how people can go home the same day of hip or knee surgery. So again, it is a lot of information. This is my website here. A lot of this information is on that website. So again, I apologize that we'll be covering a lot of material, but if you wanna review it, visit this website and feel free to look at it again. So let's start with hip arthritis basics. Let's talk, uh, talk about some anatomy. What is the hip joint? People often complain of back pain or leg pain, buttock pain, thigh pain. It's sometimes hard to tell where that hip joint actually is. But if you look at a person standing and you look at their skeleton, you will find that that joint is really living right in the groin, in the crease. So when you sit, when you flex at the hip, your hip joint really lives deep in the groin. So again, when people are complaining of lower back pain, you often buttock pain, that's often not the hip joint itself. Most classically, hip pain presents in the groin or sometimes radiates to the side of the hip. As you can see on this diagram here, this is where that ball and socket joint lives in relation to the rest of the body. The hip joint is a ball and socket joint. So you can see in this diagram, this is looking at the right hip and that blue on, the, on that ball, that represents the top of the thigh bone, that represents cartilage. And that ball lives in the socket. And that socket's called the acetabulum, that's in the pelvis. So what happens is you get a ball and socket joint, that's what lets the hip joint move so freely with so many degrees of motion. And so that representation shows you what the bony anatomy is. In this 
animation, I'm going to try to show you how that hip moves. So here's a hip that's flexing, right? So it's bending at the waist, it's going backwards, extending, it's going outwards, it's going inwards, it then rotates. You can see how the benefits of having a ball and socket joint gives you many degrees of freedom of motion. But because of that, there has to be cartilage covering all of those areas. So that entire ball needs to be covered with cartilage, the entire inside of that cup needs to be covered with cartilage in order to have smooth and painless motion. So what happens when something's going wrong in the hip? What are the classic signs of hip pain? Typically, people will describe groin pain, as I mentioned. Sometimes it will be in the inner side of that thigh. Usually it's pain with weight bearing. It may occur when people sit for prolonged periods of time or when they change position, when getting up from a chair or sitting down or getting out of a car. They may feel some pain or catching or even weakness in that groin area, which is often representative of underlying hip pathology. Classically, in terms of function, people notice they're having more difficulty doing, putting on their shoes and socks. They have more difficulty putting, doing stairs. Those kind of activities are classic for a hip pathology. So if you haven't seen x-rays of a hip, this is a normal hip. So this is a right hip, this is a ball and socket, and you can see that ball in the socket and you can see the space between the two. It's a small picture, but you can see, hopefully, that there's space between the ball and socket. That's where the cartilage lives. Cartilage is invisible on x-ray, so when it's present on the ball and the socket, that's what makes that gap on x-ray. X-ray just shows the bones, it does not show the muscles and tendons and ligaments. It just shows where those bones are and how much space there is in between them, and that's how we know there's cartilage. When you look at the x-ray with some arthritis, you can see that it starts to get a little more narrow. So here, someone who has mild to moderate arthritis, that ball is now getting closer to that socket. You can see that there's less space, less gap at the top of the ball. And as it gets worse, you can see now even less space. Or you can see the bone starting to get brighter white. It's getting harder because things that are dense show white on x-ray. It's getting harder like marble because it's rubbing and it's becoming more irritated and reacting and responding to that added stress. So this is a very arthritic hip. You can see it can also start to form cysts. So those dark areas you see is where fluid is now entering the bone. You can see that those are classic hallmarks of arthritis on x-ray. And you can see in this hip, the hip is even starting to migrate out of that socket. And in the most extreme case, you can see here that there's just no ball left. This is somewhat radical, but in this patient, they actually wore through the entire ball of their upper thigh. So clearly they need something like a surgery to address this. But that's an example of a very mild to a quite severe x-ray representation of hip arthritis. The bottom line is unfortunately there's no way to cure arthritis. Arthritis is often wear and tear. It's loss of that protective cushion. Like that white cartilage on the end of a chicken bone, imagine just wearing that away, scraping it off with a spoon or a knife and getting down to the raw bone. Once that happens, unfortunately we don't have a way of growing and putting back cartilage. We will talk about this a little bit more with stem cells and other things, but as of now, we can't grow back and return your normal cartilage. Things like arthroscopic treatment, which is more common in the knee, often treats things like loose bodies or meniscus tears. Hip arthroscopy can be formed in the hip, but none of these procedures put cartilage back. These procedures just remove loose bodies or torn cartilage. But again, with arthritis, the problem is a loss of cartilage. Arthroscopy won't re re uh, reverse that. So what do you do if you have hip pain? What do you do if you have the beginning of arthritis? How do you deal with it? Well, first you start with non-operative treatments. So we're gonna go over some of those things now. The first thing are over-the-counter medications. So the first class are non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, or NSAIDs in short. These are the common Advils or Aleves or ibuprofens you have in your kitchen cabinet. The reason these work is because they are mild pain relievers and they also reduce inflammation. So whenever you have aches or pains and you take one, you feel better because it's giving you an anti-inflammatory effect and again, a mild analgesic. The downsides of it is that it can have a reversible effect on platelets, so it can cause some bleeding in some individuals, and you have to be cautious taking it if you're already on a blood thinner. So if you're on Coumadin or Xarelto or Eliquis or Plavix or on some other blood thinner for a different reason, you have to be cautious taking an NSAID because it can potentially make you bleed even more. It also is metabolized by the kidneys, so if you have a kidney dysfunction, you have to be careful taking this, speak to your doctor. But this is by far one of the more common medications in all of our medicine cabinets that we take when we have the generalized ache or pain, and it certainly works for arthritis of the hip or knee or any other body part. Aspirin is another anti-inflammatory. Many of us are taking it perhaps for its heart benefits, but it's also an anti-inflammatory and can reduce pain and inflammation. 
Acetaminophen, you want to realize, is a totally different class of medications. Acetaminophen is Tylenol. And acetaminophen reduces pain. You're familiar with it because it reduces fever. It does not reduce inflammation, but it does help pain. It's metabolized completely differently than NSAIDs. It's metabolized by the liver, and it does not affect bleeding. So if you do have bleeding issues or kidney problems or you have risk of bleeding and you can't take the NSAIDs, then Tylenol is something that you can take safely, and it can reduce pain. You can take it in addition to Advil or ibuprofen. Because they're different classes, you can take acetaminophen on the same day as NSAIDs and be safe. Both these medications are safe. I give it to my children. They are, they are safe and a good first line to take if you're having joint pains. Narcotics are very common, known as Tylenol with codeine or Percocet, oxycodone, uh, Vicodins. These are obviously very strong pain relievers. We don't recommend that people are on medications like this for routine joint pain because you'd rather get it treated than rely on narcotics like this. There's certainly an opioid epidemic occurring in the United States and you don't want to fall prey to any of those side effects or adverse events by being on those. If you do require that to manage your joint pain, it's recommended that you see someone about it so that you can have it treated. Now there are supplements and many people are taking supplements. This is a multi-billion dollar industry in the United States and many of you are, I am sure are taking supplements for various reasons. And if it works for you, there's no problem with it. Glucosamine chondroitin sulfate is a common one that people ask about when they have arthritis because this is described or at least recommended in the food store for those who have worn cartilage. Now, glucosamine conjoined sulfate is a building block of cartilage that exists in healthy cartilage, but realize when you buy the supplement, what you buy on the shelf of the GNC or the grocery store is not approved by the FDA. It's classified as a dietary supplement, so its efficacy and safety has not actually been studied. There is no study proving that this does anything. It's not going to regrow cartilage. It's not going to reverse arthritis. Some people claim it makes them feel better, and I can't argue with that, and, and that's quite okay if it does work for them. But just realize we don't have the scientific backing to prove it. Again, because glucosamine chondroitin sulfate is a building block of cartilage, one of my mentors in training told me that taking this would be analogous to a bald man who eats hair. Meaning, just because you have a defect somewhere, just because you eat it, doesn't mean your body's going to put it where you want it. But again, if it works for you, it's safe to take. You just want to make sure you're not you know, losing money or wasting money on something that's not actually making a difference. And similar to these other supplements, there are many of them with very creative names. Again, if it works for you, it's fine to take, but just realize there is no science, there's no actual data that these things will reverse your arthritis or your pain. Physical therapy can help. Range of motion and flexibility certainly is good to maintain around the joint because maintaining that flexibility and muscle strength can help compensate for the process going on in the joint. It will not cure the problem, but it may make the symptoms less. It may make your function better. So physical therapy can help. Stretching and strengthening certainly is beneficial, but just realize the last line here that the benefits are lost within six months of stopping that program. So if it does work for you, make sure you continue it um, because otherwise that underlying pathology will become more apparent. Moving on to something a little bit more invasive, if those things fail, those are obviously first line, you can try something like injection therapy. Something like cortisone is a powerful anti-inflammatory. It can be injected into the, into the joint with the discomfort. It will reduce pain. It's usually mixed with a Novocaine-like product, so there's instant numbing action. But the cortisone works by reducing inflammation and hopefully pain longer term. It's very unusual to have an allergic reaction. It's very unusual to have a side effect from an injection. They're usually pretty safe. Really, the downside is just how long will they last? For some people, they feel better for a day because of the nummy medicine. Some people, they feel better for a week. Some people, they're lucky and they feel better for a few weeks or even a few months, but it's highly variable and not every injection is as effective as the next one. But it's something that can be used just to get through a particularly difficult time. Visco supplementation is hyaluronic acid. So you may have heard of it or your friends have heard of it where it's a gel, it's a lubrication. Basically it goes into the joint and gives it some fluid. The idea is that it provides some pain relief and reduces some inflammation. Again, it's highly variable in its response or its effectiveness for people. Some people will have zero effect. Some people will get a benefit for a few weeks, some people for a few months. There are even some people who just come in twice a year to get this injected. Again, the purpose is not to cure arthritis. The purpose is not to regrow cartilage. It's purely symptomatic treatment. Hopefully it makes people feel better, but it's a band-aid on a gunshot wound, for example. It's not going to cure anything. It may buy you some time. It's also very low risk. Typically people often do not have 
uh, allergic reactions to, to it. You can repeat it safely twice a year if it, if it works for you. But again, it is not a cure, but it is an option for people if they have pain resistant to the other modalities we discussed. There's a lot of discussion about these biologics, and the biologics include things like platelet-rich plasma. That's a treatment where you can take blood from an individual, you can spin it down and prepare it and, and concentrate platelets, and then give it back to the patient in the specific joint of need. There's been some studies where this can be helpful in some tendonitis issues or some soft tissues issues. This has not been as good at showing that it's helpful with joints that are arthritic. And this is similar to stem cells. So stem cells have been a catchphrase for a number of years. It certainly has a lot of hope and a lot of interest. The, the downside is we just don't have the technology to tell that stem cell what to become. We can't tell that stem cell to regrow the cartilage in that joint. So stem cells and platelet-rich plasma are options because there's no data showing that how effective it is or that it even works, no insurance covers it. So that's why these two things are out of pocket. They can be quite expensive at $1,000 up to $8,000. So it's a lot of money to invest in something that may or may not actually help. And again, at this time, we just don't have the data to show that it will make any significant difference. But if it works for you, you can certainly try it. It's just potentially a lot of cost. There are many gadgets and devices that you'll see. You'll see these in the store. You'll see them on television. Do these things work? Some people say it does. I like this one on the right particularly. It's called the arthritis killer. That one sounds particularly, particularly good, and it would be great if it was effective. The problem is with a lot of these things, we don't know if they work. Maybe they give some heat. Maybe they give some, some mild pain relief, but it's not going to reverse the arthritis, of course. It may make you feel better, but again, just like anything else, be cautious. Uh, don't fall prey to paying for something that's not going to be effective for you, but certainly it's okay to try. They're safe. So let's say you've exhausted all of those things, and now you need something to treat your painful hip. You're now more limited, the medications aren't working, you're limping more, you can't do the activities that you want to do. That's the time when you decide to address it, and that's when you start considering something like hip replacement. So it's important to know what hip replacement is, so we'll talk about that now. Hip replacement is, remember those ball and socket pictures, it's giving you a new ball and socket. So because there's no cartilage on the ball or that socket, you have to re you have to re replace it. And what happens is you get a artificial ball that's attached to a stem, as you can see here, and that stem fixes into the thigh bone. So the center cavity, the marrow of the thigh bone, is an ideal place to place a stem where you can fix that rigidly and then attach a new ball to it, as you see here. And then a metal cup goes into the pelvis, that acetabulum I showed you, to give you a new socket. So now you have an artificial ball moving on an artificial socket, a liner of some type, some material, where now you don't have pain. You have better motion, and it takes away that pain. This has been around since the 60s. Sir Charlie started this a long time ago, decades ago, with cement, and we'll talk about the differences there. And then Bill Harris was at Harvard at Mass General, where I trained, and he really is the American godfather of hip replacement. So he really developed a lot of the techniques we use today. So these are examples of various stems. So you can see they come in different shapes and sizes. They can be personalized to the individual's anatomy. And the pictures on the left show a cemented stem where the stem goes into the bone. It's filled with cement, just like the cement you get at the dentist or a cement that's used for knee replacement. That cement rigidly fix that, fixes that stem into the bone immediately. So people can walk on it right away. They don't have to have any worries. They can put weight on it immediately from leaving the operating room because that stem is cemented into place and is solid. Again, just like knee replacement. The three pictures on the right show a different technology where these stems are actually cementless. So what happens is, I don't know if you can tell, but on those stems there's a gritty, there's a porous coating on it. And what happens is, is that it's made in such a way that the bone adheres to it. The bone likes it and actually will grow into it. And so that's its fixation. That obviously takes time, so these implants have to be wedged in the bone securely enough initially that they will grow in and be secure as you wait perhaps six weeks for the bone to really grow and attach to it. But those are the two different fixation techniques, and in a lot of the choice of what to use depends on the patient's anatomy and the patient's bone quality. But these are the options we have to fix these components. Here's just a little closer diagram of what hip replacement is. You remember that ball and socket. You can see when that ball is diseased and has no more cartilage, we make a cut and remove that ball. And that makes space and gives us access to that cavity of the thigh bone so that we can place the stem as you see here. We can place that cup into the pelvis and put liner and a ball there so that now the ball and socket's restored. It has the same 
soft tissue tension, the same leg length, the same mechanics, but now it will move freely and without that pain. Traditional hip replacements in the diagram on the left, and this is how I was trained back in the day many years ago, where you would do a big, large exposure, you could see the anatomy well, and you could do the surgery, and it would be quite uh, straightforward and easy. And there's nothing wrong with traditional hip replacement. It works exceptionally well. In the end, what we want is a long-lasting, good result. Traditional hip replacement works fine, but if we can give you the same good long-term result through a smaller incision, through quicker recovery, through less pain, less blood loss, why wouldn't we do that? And that's what the picture is on the right. It's harder to do less invasive surgeries, but when you go to a specialist who does a lot of them, that's where we can see quicker recoveries and some of these benefits we'll talk about shortly. People want people more and more want to get back to an active lifestyle. They want to get to back to work sooner. They want to get back to driving, to playing tennis, to playing golf, to doing the activity they want to after their joint replacement. With less invasive, minimally invasive surgery, people have a shorter recovery time. There's less patient pain less blood loss, shortened hospital stay, people are going home routinely the next day, and in many cases, the very same day, just hours after their joint replacement. The key is to do so without increasing complication rate and obviously still having excellent long-term outcomes, but if you can achieve all those things, then people can get their life back very quickly. So in this video here, you're gonna see just, this is an x-ray of a patient. This is many years ago, probably 10 years ago, of a patient who had hip arthritis. So you can see where, how he's walking here. His hip was bone on bone and he's limping. He couldn't play golf. He had to walk with a cane, but this is him getting ready for surgery, but he's hobbling as you can see. With the rapid recovery protocols, you can replace someone's hip and you can get them up walking weight bearing right away, which you'll see. They can be walking full weight with an assist device. They can progress to a cane as soon as they feel safe. Here's his hip replacement. Here's him walking a couple hours after surgery. And I don't have the audio, but what he's saying is, that the knee pain he had, the leg pain he had from his hip arthritis is already gone. So even though he just did a hip replacement, even though he's recovering from that, here he is walking right away without that pain. Here he is the following morning, and again, this is about 10, 12 years ago, where he's walking with a cane and already doing stairs on his new hip. And what you're gonna find is he's already feeling better than he did before surgery. And this was 10 years ago, you know, the morning after surgery. So with our current protocols, this is him 12 days after surgery at his follow-up visit. So you can see that people can walk with a cane and, and, and progress to that right away. They can get rid of it very quickly, as you see in this video. 95% are going directly home to the safety and comfort of their own home after joint replacement. They're driving by a couple weeks. They're playing golf and tennis-like activities at six weeks, and people are typically 95% recovered at 12 weeks. So most often after hip replacement, people will say it feels like a normal hip. So that's what hip replacement is, traditional hip replacement, and minimally invasive hip replacement. Let's talk a little bit about anterior hip replacement. What is that? So there are many approaches and different ways to get to the hip, and anterior hip replacement is just a different way to perform the same procedure through a different approach. So the direct anterior approach is really an approach that's been around for quite a long time and has been used by trauma surgeons to address hip fractures or pelvis fractures. And this was adapted for hip replacement by a surgeon named Joel Mata down in LA um, actually decades ago. And he's been slowly adapting this and gaining more and more interest in adopters of this anterior hip replacement procedure. I've had, I had the opportunity to work with him on various national panels and he actually recruited me and asked me to adopt his technique to help give my impression of how it works. So I did that starting about three years ago, and I'm gonna show you some of the results and why I find it beneficial and I'm still using it today. The access to the femur is frequently allowed by this special operating room table. So this table is unique to this approach, and what it does is it gives better access to perform some of the surgery, and I'll show you that. But the main advantages of this procedure are a reduced dislocation risk. So with other approaches, there is historically risks of hip instability or hip dislocation. This approach, it goes between muscle planes. So as you can see on the diagram on the bottom left, instead of cutting through muscle, there are natural muscle planes where you can approach the hip. You can do the surgery, put in these implants without cutting that muscle. And because of that, the hip is more stable. So the literature shows that this approach has a much lower dislocation risk. Because again, you don't cut muscle, it's tissue friendly, there's a faster recovery. So people are walking sooner, recovering quickly, and Many studies have shown that. My involvement with anterior hip replacement, again, I've had the benefit of working with Dr. Mata, and he's invited me to speak on faculty at his anterior hip foundation meeting, and I've done various research and work on it in these past few years, as you can see here. So the proposed benefits of an anterior hip are really 
adapting and growing on the prior goals that we had with minimally invasive surgery. We're trying to reduce pain, but maybe people are having even less need even less pain medication, even fewer opioids. Short and hospital stay, people are moving and walking even sooner, going home even faster, even on an outpatient basis, same day after a few hours. Again, the literature shows no increase in complication rate with this approach, but you're getting the benefits of an earlier return to function. This has been around for quite some time. And again, Dr. Ma has been doing it for three decades, but you've seen a rapid increase in adoption of this by surgeons and patients have been asking for it. If you look really, if you do something like a Google search, you will see that there are over five, six million links to anterior hip replacement in half a second. So there's a lot of information on the web and I use that just to show the interest in it. I don't say that all the information on the web is necessarily reliable or trustworthy, but it at least shows you the amount of interest out there and how much information is available. Furthermore, if you look at something like on the bottom, NPR is taking um, interest and doing articles and features on patients seeking a different approach to hip replacement. So NPR is reporting on this change because really this is a newer procedure, even still, um, which continues to get better and hopefully provide patients better results. New York Times has looked at it. Wall Street Journal has looked at it. Same day hip replacement, anterior hip replacement has really grabbed headlines and patients really have had an interest to see and learn more. So I'm the only surgeon at the Institute in Fremont who's performing anterior hip replacement. I'm the only surgeon who's, who's been trained in it. And this video was actually three years ago, and this was one of my very first patients. And so the question was, can people really do better than traditional or other approaches? And what I found was, if you look here, this is our patient who's just a couple hours after surgery, and she's already walking unassisted pretty well. And what she's saying in the audio is that she really doesn't have pain. So this was one of my very first patients. And proof is in the pudding, so to speak. It seemed to be that this approach was living up to its merits, that people were having less pain in ambulating. This is another gentleman opposite of the first woman who was on the smaller side. He's, you know, a six foot five gentleman who has a lot of, um, a lot of height and he's a bigger guy with more muscle. But you can see he's walking home um, and going home very quickly after anterior hip replacement. So what you'll find is that the literature shows that really the dislocation rate has been near zero for anterior hip replacement. That's certainly one of its major advantages. You don't have the limitations of hip range of motion and positions and precautions after this surgery like you do with other approaches. You, don't, you have less reliance on assistive devices. There's less pain and a quicker recovery, and there's been numerous studies to show that. The anterior hip advantages really are, again, not cutting muscle, it's muscle sparing, the hip stability that ensues, but also in, the, in doing this procedure, x-ray can be used when doing the procedure. So with other hip approaches, patients are typically placed on their side. And because of that, it's very difficult to use an x-ray to look at how the implants are placed. So people go to the recovery room and an x-ray is often taken there. That gives us the ability to use an x-ray so we can see how the implants are going in live. So you can confirm that the implants are put in the right position. You can see that they're the right size. You can see that they're restoring the patient's individual anatomy well. As you can see on the bottom left, here's an example of an in-operating room screen where the hip replacement on the left can be compared to the non-operative hip on the right so that you can make sure that the implant you're putting in mirrors and re replicates that patient's normal hip. This is an advantage of anterior hip replacement using this x-ray because it also allows you to confirm leg lengths. So you can make sure that you restore that patient's length accurately using the x-ray. If you look at adoption, as I said, it's adopted slowly over the years. You can see here at 2009, this is a survey of our hip and knee surgeons at our national meeting each year. So hip and knee specialists at our national hip meeting each year, how many are doing anterior hip replacement? In 2009, it was about 15%. It crossed 25% around 2014, but then you can see in 2018, it was about 40%, and in a recent poll of 2019, it's now the predominant approach. Now most surgeons, most hip and knee specialists are doing anterior hip replacement. So it's clearly been gaining more interest as people are doing better and surgeons are seeing the benefits. Here again is a patient, this is just from two weeks ago. This is about a six foot five gentleman who had his anterior hip replacement just a few hours earlier, and this is him getting ready to go home. So this is him going home from anterior hip replacement. This is just a couple weeks ago. And you can see he can walk unassisted and he can go home safely to the comfort of his home without a cane or anything else. And this bottom um, video, I don't have the audio, but this gentleman is also going home same day. He's saying that he does not have any pain and he's gonna go home just a few hours after his anterior hip replacement.
he's delighted and I don't have the video again but here's a gentleman again who had a great success with this procedure why doesn't every surgeon do anterior replacement why doesn't every surgeon do minimally invasive surgery it's because it's difficult and you have to be trained and there are challenges to it uh, this is our major orthopedic journal and what their articles have shown is that in general people do have better outcomes when they go to surgeons who do higher volume makes sense patients typically have better outcomes when they go to hospitals that do higher volume so you do have to uh, be skilled in this it's ideal if you're a specialist in this to get the best outcomes from what we've talked about this evening so my general recommendations are if you're looking at surgery if you have hip or knee pain do some research pick a surgeon and a program carefully in general higher volume generally means fewer complications and talk to a surgeon who performs the surgery that you're interested in only if they actively they really tell you the pros and cons and give you an idea of if it's best for you and anterior hip replacement as we shown does have many advantages over our traditional and other approaches now I'm going to talk about our specific joint replacement center. The institute is unique in that it is dedicated to joint replacement only. So at Washington Hospital, we have a 3-4 building dedicated only to hip and knee replacement. It has um, a staff that is dedicated only to joint replacement care from surgeons to anesthesiologists to nurses to therapists, et cetera. And so we provide an education class. We believe that education is critical to how patients do after surgery. We have uh, materials that patients are provided. We typically had an in-person class with our program. With COVID, things have been a little bit different, so it's now on the web, but we still provide that same education. We follow it up with binders full of information that explain the expectations before surgery, during surgery, as well as after, and our patients benefit from referencing that throughout their experience. And most will say that it makes a huge difference in their overall recovery and result. Our personnel, again, are trained surgeons, anesthesiologists, OR techs, nurses, therapists. This is all we do. So it takes a large team to do it, but everyone in our program is dedicated to giving the best care to our joint replacement patients. Side, there's a three-floor building. There are 30 private rooms, so isolation so that we can keep the healthy people away from the sicker people in the hospital. That was true before surgery, uh, sorry, before COVID. That's obviously even more important now post-COVID. So the benefit is, again, a freestanding three-floor building only for joint replacement patients where healthy elective patients come for surgery, and they're all give in, given private rooms, and they can be assured that the nurses, therapists, and staff, the only people they're taking care of are other healthy elective joint replacement patients. Because of the high volume of, of surgery that's done here, it gives us the benefit of doing a lot of research, so it allows me to be involved presenting my results and my patients' outcomes at national meetings. It allows me to be involved with many of our national leadership committees. And because of that, I have the benefit of remaining academic, even though I'm in private practice at this community hospital, so that I can share my ideas, learn techniques, learn to our community here. That is, I think, a very important part of practicing medicine is staying up to date on the newest advances. So that's really where research helps us with that. This is where we are in Fremont. Uh, we are fortunate to have such a unique program that that's why we draw patients. We have patients coming from three hours away, five hours away, driving, or even flying out of state. We do not take that lightly. We understand that these patients are driving by many other programs to come here, so we really want to deliver and make sure we give the best outcomes possible in the most personal way. That's really our commitment to our patients, as I mentioned before. We are a community hospital. We serve the Tri-City area. We see the majority of my patients come from many other places, other places in Central Valley, California, Northern California, Peninsula, or you know, Southern area. And you can see on the right, even patients coming from all over the country. So people will fly to our program. And we, again, think that that's a great privilege. In terms of the program's accolades, it has been reviewed by patients with satisfaction. This is just one example of a survey where patients describe their satisfaction with their experience, and it is routinely at the top of the nation's list. Becker's, which you may hear of, they often do hospital reviews, and Washington Hospital has been recognized as one of the outstanding programs even in the country. Health grades you can look up online. They rank various hospitals and programs, and our hip and knee replacement programs have been five stars, their top mark really for uh, many, many years in a row. We were even the top number one joint replacement center in California a few years ago. So we're very fortunate to have a program that's recognized by health grades like that. We're one of the few that is, is five stars in both categories in California. Consumer Report came out with this a couple years ago, and what you can see is the top is 
surgery for knee surgery, and Washington Hospital is one of the top in the state for knee surgery, but we're also one of the top in hip surgery. So if you combine the two, we are one of only maybe five in the state that gets Consumer Reports top ranking for both hip and knee surgery. Secondly, we'll talk, second to last, we'll talk about rapid recovery, knee and hip surgery. How do we get people recovered faster? If you're gonna have surgery, how do you do it so that you can have the quickest recovery and the best outcome possible? This is where things have really advanced over the recent years. Perioperative advancements such as pain control and blood management have been a key in the success of driving more rapid recovery. We're gonna talk about that a little bit. Historically, pain management has been driven by narcotics, as you know. But narcotics, unfortunately, have many side effects and many potential adverse events. So now we want to try to stray away from those if we can. A recent database study looking at people in 2012, looking at practitioners, what did they prescribe when people had pain? Amazingly, nearly three out of four physicians would prescribe narcotics only even in our more current era when there are so many other medications available. And that's probably because that's how physicians have been trained, that's what we're used to, and that's what's been effective. But we all know of the side effects. We know of the opioid crisis. How do we get people's pain to be relieved without depending on those medicines, which can be so dangerous, to be honest? So really learning how to address pain. I've had a strong focus in this, so I've worked with a, a lot of other surgeons and other techniques on how to get pain management better. This is a busy diagram, but this shows how, what's involved with pain. Pain really involved an insult at a tissue source, an injury, and that's transmitted along to a nerve, to the spinal cord, and then to the brain. It's a complex pathway where that pain moves from the site of injury to the brain to be interpreted as pain. But because of that, there are many opportunities, as you hear. These white bubbles basically show you the various medications that can help intercept that pain signal and where they can intercept that pain signal. So you can imagine, rather than relying on a single medication that works in only one place, what if you use many medications to intercept that pain, pain signal along the way to really dull it or numb it? And that's where I've done some work and published some studies looking at how this multimodal, meaning using many different medicines in smaller doses to give a better overall effect can be effective. That's where my work and some of these presentations have been focused on. So what are the, um, what's involved in this pain protocol? There are many things, and here are some examples. Something as simple as Tylenol, something you have in your medicine cabinet. You don't think of it as being something significant to relieve pain as significant as surgical pain, but it actually can help, especially when it's put in combination with these other medicines. Intravenous Tylenol, for example, is available, and that can, may have even better effect because you can, it can be delivered and be placed intravenously to have a quicker onset of action and better pain relief. But if you combine that with an anti-inflammatory, one of those NSAIDs I spoke about, certainly hold anti-inflammatories. Celebrex and this Ketorolac, which is an intravenous uh, medication, these are just different forms of an NSAID, which, when in combination with something as simple as Tylenol, has shown in the literature to reduce pain by 40 to 50%. You can even add it on to something like a Lyrica or a nerve type medicine. When you add all these medicines in small doses, you can actually have a profound effect and you haven't even had an opioid yet. Using things like regional anesthesia, where we, where we benefit from the help of our fantastic anesthesia colleagues, they can use epidural or span, spinal anesthesia during surgery. So you can avoid general anesthesia or being intubated or depending on a breathing tube. You can breathe on your own, you can be drowsy if you like, but the anesthesia is just numb waist down for minimal side effects, but great pain relief. They can also do various nerve blocks if appropriate. So our anesthesiologists have really helped in providing regional anesthesia and pain control around elective surgery. And then there are other injections. This is an example of a novel injection, which is like Novocaine, something you get at the dentist, but as you know, that wears off in a few hours. Here, this Novocaine basically is encapsulated in these special vesicles or bubbles that you inject around the hip or knee at the time of surgery, and it, and it releases over a delayed period of time. So here, what they show is that blue curve is showing that instead of wearing off in four to six hours, like typical Novocaine, this can provi provide local pain relief for two, maybe even three days. So you can imagine where you put all these things together, people can have great pain relief, again, while trying to minimize or even avoid opioids. And this is just an example of some of the work that I've done on multimodal pain management.
Beyond that, we also want to minimize things like bleeding, because bleeding certainly can cause wound complications, it can cause swelling, it can cause pain. If we can do something to minimize bleeding around elective joint surgery, that would also speed recovery. So something like this, using a simple medication which can help stabilize clots and minimize bleeding around surgery, has really been a game changer in joint replacement in recent years. You add onto that a technology which can uh, seal soft tissue so it doesn't continue to bleed. We use this at the time of surgery. That way people can get up and walk immediately after surgery and not worry about excessive bleeding and have the associated pain and swelling that would usually come. And then if you look at something as simple as this, something like special sutures, using these barbed sutures which help close the incision, this is somewhat, uh, this is very unique actually, where instead of tying a suture and tying knots, the suture has barbs in it so it engages the tissue and it closes it like a zip line. It closes it so it's watertight, but what's most important is that it closes the wound securely and allows the patient to walk or bend on that knee or that hip and it can resist that kind of motion. So it lets people move the, the fresh wound, keeping it watertight and letting it heal well, yet at the same time allowing immediate therapy. So even simple like things are critical to that overall package of getting faster recovery and better outcomes. This is an example of using that suture at two weeks, what it looks like, it melts away under the skin, there's nothing to remove at six weeks, and then at 12 weeks, what it looks like by using that suture. And lastly, using something like a dressing. Who would think that a dressing could make a difference? But traditionally, we used to cover our hip and knee incisions with gauze and tape, and you'd have to change it every day, and it could potentially leave blisters and irritate the skin. Here is a dressing that actually can stay on for seven days. We place it in the operating room. It remains sterile under there because it's placed in a sterile environment, and it even has a little antimicrobial uh, silver on the dressing. So you can see in that bar graph, a study out of Philadelphia showed that by just by using this dressing, they had a 76% reduction of infection. So who would have thought something like a dressing could have that profound an effect? But this is something that, again, is very convenient. It's safe. It gives patients the peace of mind that their incision will remain sterile and infection, hopefully infection-free. But also, they can get up on it, walk on it right away. It moves and it's flexible, and you can shower right away because it's waterproof. So simple things like this, simple conveniences, is what's leading to something like outpatient surgery, which who would have thought was possible? You know, a decade ago or two, people would never have thought people would go home within hours of a hip or knee replacement, but now it's becoming commonplace. People typically were in the hospital for three or four days after joint replacement. That has changed dramatically. So I'm involved with a lot of the development of outpatient joint replacement. I speak at national meetings about how to develop these programs based on my experience. And what I try to tell these other surgeons is as you develop these these protocols, as you try to take someone to a surgery center or try to provide outpatient surgery at your main hospital, you have to have all these things in place. It's very involved. It's more work, not less work. But I go into detail with surgeons how they have to select the right patient, educate them well, have all these perioperative protocols optimized, have rehab protocols, a very good support system, and of course, follow up for that patient. All these things have to be in place for successful outpatient joint surgery, or else there will be some failures. So that's what I stress to others when I teach it, but this is happening. It's happening near you. Um, maybe some of your friends have had it. People are having joint replacement. Um, going home faster, recovering quicker. This is just some of the work that I've done early uh, on in 2014 and 15, presenting my work and studies at our national meetings on how we here have been doing same-day joint replacement surgery. So again, this is an interesting woman. This She's 82 years young, and she's two weeks after having her anterior hip replacement. So 82, two weeks after she had her other hip replacement with a traditional uh, fashion but had some complications but the anterior replacement she had much greater benefit from. Here's a woman who's great. She sent me this video. I thought it was quite funny. She wanted to send me a video of her walking at home the day after surgery. Just drops her cane on the floor in the hallway. So that made me smile when I saw that email. But this just shows what people can do when they get home. Basically that just shows how people, what people can do and how well they can do after this type of surgery. So I'm just going to try to bring this up. People are recovering well, and because of that, people are having surgeries in their main hospital, but people are also having surgeries in their surgery center. And so people are finding that they can recover quickly and they can avoid the hospital if, they, if, they're, if it's appropriate. So if it's safe for them, if they can do that, then they will. Obviously, the hospital here is quite safe as well, but some people opt to be, have their surgery at a surgery center. But either way, people can go home from either facility or in a hospital setting, they can spend the night as well. 
this again is that that gentleman that we saw before uh, talking about his hip at at leaving the same day this is actually him six weeks later he had his other hip replaced through an anterior approach so th there are two videos of him leaving same day he's saying he doesn't have pain and feeling quite well after hip replacement he had them just six weeks apart so with these kind of outcomes, this has given the benefit of, of allowing me to develop the outpatient joint program that we have here. Um, we're one of the programs working with a group and they, they have two facilities. We're the West Coast representative for them. But because of that, both hip and knee replacement can be, for, can be performed on an outpatient basis. And this is actually a gentleman of mine, two weeks after one knee replacement, six weeks after his other, he went home same day from the surgery center after both. So this is just some of the work and other things that I've done in regards to outpatient joint replacement again, teaching other surgeons and other programs and presenting our data on how we do here. I appreciate your attention. This has been a lot of information. So again, I want to refer you to my website. A lot of this can be reviewed there. You will see it here that you can review these materials or see some of these videos. Up here up top is where you can make an appointment if you want to. We're obviously happy to see you and evaluate you and see what the best treatment is for your particular joint pain. And in closing, I'm just going to show some of these videos because I think this is the best. I love it when I get these emails from my patients and they show me the things that they're doing. This was actually a wife sort of tattling on her husband, showing me that he was playing golf at four weeks after surgery. But I thought that was pretty impressive. And then this is a woman who loves to do dog agility. So six weeks after her partial knee replacement, she gets to back to doing the things she loves. And this one I'm not so sure about, but this is six weeks after surgery. He likes to be dragged by a boat. You can see here he is water skiing and he's doing this six weeks after knee replacement. So it's always great to see patients getting back to what they love, even just a few weeks or months after joint replacement. And I'm going to leave with this last video playing. I think it's a kind of an interesting video. This is a patient of mine a couple years ago after hip replacement and his particular passion is to fly these paragliders. So it has a huge fan on the back and this parasail basically and he essentially can fly wherever he wants. But this is him doing this about six weeks, eight weeks after hip surgery. So with that, I thank you again for your attention. I hope that this was helpful. I again apologize for trying to cover a lot of information, but hopefully it was useful to you and feel free to visit our website or call our office with any other questions. Thank you very much.